Good evening from New York. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. The gentleman next to me is Mr. Alex Bonvery. I am especially excited tonight because Alex is a, a son of our soil, a Guyanese born brother. Um, Alex is a Guyanese Canadian Hall of Fame footballer who represented the Canadian national team six to seven times and is currently their fourth all time leading scorer. He is currently the all-time uh, leading scorer for Canada in World Cup qualifying matches with 14 goals. Additionally, he was the first player in Canadian history to score three goals in a World Cup qualifying game. He was the first player in Canadian history to win Canadian Player of the Year, an honor twice bestowed. 2005 Hall of Fame inductee, Quebec Soccer Federation. 2006 Hall of Fame inductee, Canadian Soccer Association. 2012, Best 11 of the, of the Past 100 Years, CSA and Fan Nomination. 2015, Hall of Fame inductee, Hamilton Steelers, FC Canadian Soccer. I could go on and on with this, brother. Alex, welcome to CWS Journeys. Oh, my man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Alex, what are usually accurate about the way those close to you describe you? Oh, wow. Wow. Um... You know, I, I, I don't look at myself. It's hard for me to, to put to words how people would describe me. I just try to be who I am and uh, who God created me to be um, with the upbringing that my parents instilled in myself and my siblings. So I try to be humble. Mm -hmm. I try to, to, to advance uh, the cause for those that are disadvantaged. And I conduct myself in, the, in a way that, that I think best uh, bestowed upon someone with humility. And that's how I look at myself. I, it's hard for me to put myself in a position where I think of what people would say of me. Um, I just go out and try to be the best that I can be. Talk about your parents. Uh, I understand you come from a large family, Alex. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm the youngest of 13. So uh, <laughs> Youngest of 13? Youngest of 13, I have eight brothers and uh, four sisters. My mom, Doreen, and my, bro my, my dad, Harry Bunbury. Um, I mean, God bless them. They, they raised us to be good young people, that, good people that are respectful to ourselves, first and foremost, and respectful to others. And most importantly, they instilled in us the, uh, the, the, the importance of having faith in God Almighty. And I think that, that has been the, the, the foundation of who we are as a family. For those who grew up in very small family, and I know small is relative, right. what are two things you can share with us that define, you know, defines a large family, apart from the numbers? Well, I, I think it, it, it becomes a unity. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 you bond. You, you, you rely on each other. And, um, and that unity is very powerful. And it, it keeps us uh, grounded but it keeps us motivated as well because being the youngest, I had so many older siblings to look up to. So, uh, you know, I, I, th there were role models to me and, and they were passing down to me and my, my other siblings um, the way of life that they were given in terms of what my parents instilled in them as well. So the unity thing I think is the most important. And we're, we're a tight knit family. We love each other. We're always there for each other, no matter what. Unconditional love, as, as my you know, mom would say. Something to be said about people who come at the, 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 the last of a large family is that the last one is usually spoiled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I deny that. I deny that way into my adult years, and I look back, I say, you know what, I, yeah, I think maybe a little. Have you, were you spoiled? Um, yeah, I would think so, because I, I think that everyone looked out for me being the youngest, and if that means that I was spoiled, I'll take it any time, any day. Um, my mom really wanted my old, older siblings to look out for me and they always did to this day. So I, I, I would, I would, I guess I would have to categorize it as being spoiled. Yeah. I love it though. I love it that my, my siblings would give me that much attention. And you, you left Guyana at an early age, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but prior to leaving Guyana, can, can you give us a glimpse of life growing up in Guyana in the early years before you oh, left? Oh man, it was simple. It was beautiful. Um, uh, Pleasance it took a village, right? It took everyone, and everyone had a responsibility in raising the young kids, you know, your immediate family. And then when you walked out of that uh, uh, protection, 
and that comfort zone, that safe haven, you walked outside and there were other families that are relatives and, and neighbors that took care of you and made sure that you were on the right path. So it was fantastic. I loved it. What do you miss most about growing up in Pleasance? Well, how simple it was. Mm. I, like, man, I, I, I didn't know I was poor. That's how simple and beautiful it was. I didn't know how poor I was until I went back, really, to, uh, to Pleasance uh, in last January. Um, so that should tell you how beautiful it was. We had fun. We enjoyed life. My mom and dad always had food on the table for us. And, and it was just simple life, man. Simple life. It was beautiful. Alex, take, take us to, I think it's Montreal you moved to in the, when you first moved to Canada. Take us to yes. Montreal when you first got there. The culture shock. What was that like? Well, man, uh, first of all, it was cold, mm. right? It was cold. I wasn't used to that. And I was away from my friends. So there was a culture shock. It was different. I, I have to be honest with you. I never saw white people before. Mm. And that was the first time I really saw white people, a whole bunch of white people. And that to me was even different. And, and it, it's, it's very revealing, right? Because you're so used to the people that you're around and you're in that comfort zone. I never saw that many white people, so I had to get used to that as well. And it was awesome because uh, some of my best friends turned out to be people that are from a different culture, saw things life differently, and, and we're, we're life, life, lifeline. I mean, our friendship is, is forever. And, um, but that was, that was the one thing that stood out for me, for sure. You know, what both you and I can attest to, um, Alex, is that it is not difficult. Uh, it's not easy. It cannot be easy for parents to raise that many children. I, I am the last of nine. You're 13. Um, and, and instill values, keep them together, keep the family together, and raise such um, principled people, women and children. Um, I mean, men and women. What, what, do you, what do you remember most about your parents and, and how they helped to shape the man you have become today? Oh, wow. You're going to get me emotional here. Uh, my dad was a man that loved his family. Um, he worked hard for his family. He would do anything for his family. So I, I got that about giving and working hard for your family. My mom was the rock. And mm. um, she did everything that was necessary to make sure that we were in, in a comfort zone. And she provided us with, with, with love and affection because my dad was away most of the time. So we got that love and affection from my mom. She taught us how to conduct ourselves, how to be respectful, how to be loving and giving to others, how to be selfless, not selfish. So um, I got, my parents are, uh, I mean, I, I kind of think of them like biblical uh, individuals, how they, conduct, how they lived their lives and how they stood, to, uh, uh, stood together for so many years and never left us. They were there for us through thick and thin. Love them. Alex, <laughs> later on in the conversation, we're going to talk a bit about the work you were doing with young people and empowering young people and so on. But I want to spend a little bit more time on your early timeline. Um, if, if you were to eavesdrop your parents, mm -hmm. telling a stranger about you, how do you think each of them will describe you? Let's start with mom. What would she say? Mom would say that... Um, you know, my, my real name, people don't know this, is Marlon, Marlon Alexander Bunbury. And um, when, I, when I left Guyana, Plaisance, at the age of nine, um, something got mixed up, in my, in, and it was just Alexander Bunbury. So I was named Alexander, and uh, it's Alex. Um, my, uh, my parents, what my mom would say about me was maybe that I was this kid that always wanted to excel and uh, never took no for an answer and, uh, and was always very loving and caring and respectful to his older siblings and others. And I think that, that is the thing that I, I, I think my mom would say about me. Um, you know, he always wanted to be the best that he could be, even at a young age. He's always challenged that. And, and dad? My dad would probably say that, you know, he was uh, the love of his mother's life. <laughs> and... Um, and that he, he, he's, 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 he's proud of how it all turned out because he, he persevered. My dad would be very proud of that. And he would say that about me. I, I would think that would be the thing because my dad believed in perseverance. Yeah. 
Alex, you, you're a father yourself. You have four children, amazing yes. children. You know, yes. Kylie, an actress who is oh, yeah. um, on, I think it's Fox, uh, uh, new series yes. um, pitch. Um, yes. And your son, Teal, who follow your footstep. He's, he's played for, um, representing the New York US team. And yes. two other young children, one is a sing and the other one following your footsteps too. When you reflect on your children, what goes through your mind? Well, you know, I, I, you know. Listen, I, I don't walk on water. I, I'm not. I wasn't the perfect son or the perfect father or husband and what have you. Um, at times, I made mistakes over the years. And the thing that I'm most proud of is is it, that I that God has blessed me with four of the most amazing kids that you can have. Uh, my daughter being the oldest out of the bunch, she, she went through a lot to, to get to where she is. She's overcome a lot. And, and, and I'm so proud of her. I love her to death. Um, my son, Teal, what can I say about that young man following in his dad's footsteps? That could never be easy. My son, Logan, um, who's a musician, you know, and, and very talented, was extremely talented football player as well. And then my youngest, Mateo, happened to be in Portugal right now in, the, uh, in their sporting uh, Lisbon's uh, academy, the, one of the best, if not the best academy in the world for football, where Cristiano, uh, where Cristiano Ronaldo developed. I cannot be any prouder of my kids. And I love them to death. And their success is a part of, of me. And, and, and I hope I'm a part of them and their moms. And uh, I'm telling you, their mothers have done fantastic jobs for these kids to develop them and, and nurture them. And I give them so much credit as well. We're talking about Teal following his father's footstep. And I, at the top of the, the um, conversation, I read some of your awards and honors and so on. When were you first introduced to soccer? <laughs> um, here's the story. I never liked soccer as a young boy in Pleasant. The sport that I played was cricket. Um, I loved cricket. And I never touched a soccer ball. I never touched a football. Um, when we came to Canada, my, uh, my, my older siblings, my, my brother Roy, my brother Bumbo, my late brother Morel Bunbury, who was a phenomenal football player along with my other brother Roy, my brother Sam Bunbury and, and, and Tony, well known as Orton, these guys were exceptional football players. So when I came to Canada, um, I fell in love with hockey and basketball. And my brothers were getting tired of me not playing soccer. And, and they, at the age of 12, that's when I first took up soccer, fell in love with it. There was something about soccer that just fell in place with me. And I fell in love with the sport and I had a passion for it. And it was, uh, it was a moment, I can remember it like it was yesterday. The first time I, saw, I touched a soccer ball in a, in a, a team setting, it was something was just, it just overwhelmed me with joy. And I fell in love with it that day and, and I'm, I'm passionate about it to this day. When, when did you start playing at a professional level? I just out of high school when I was 18 years of age. Wow. Yeah. wow. 18. Yes. You said, um, I understand your older siblings, they played soccer at a professional yes. level. Yes. What was that like? Tell us about the pressure to... Or were you pressured to live up to their expectations, to fill their shoes? No? No. No, that's the beauty of it. I was not pressured. Um, I was just very, I was supported. You know? Once again, we go we revert back to the unity mm -hmm. and or that, that my parents instilled in us. And that's what I got. I got that from my big brother, Roy, who had came to every one of my professional games. Roy. Yes, Roy, who's well no, better known as Deep back in Pleasant. Mm -hmm. He came to every one of my games, my brother, my late brother, Leon, who was there every one of my games. So I had that support from my siblings and they never pressured me to play the sport. They just supported me and, and, and they gave me encouragement. And, and I, I'm forever grateful for that. What does it mean to be recognized as one of the top players at the World Youth Championship Tournament in Minsk, Russia? Wow. I mean, when I found that out, that was, that was, you know, not a lot of people know about this, but after the World Youth Championship in Minsk, Russia in 85, I was recognized as one of the top youth players. And, 
And from that moment on, I got called up to be on the 86 World Cup team that qualified for, uh, uh, for the World Cup in Canada. I got called into their last camp and I, I, I didn't make the squad. I'm very disappointed to this day. I was an alternate, but, but to get that recognition and that was very, very rewarding. And obviously you, you can't do it on your own, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you perform, you perform with other teammates and coaches and, and you get a support mechanism. So I give praise to all my teammates and coaching staff that were there for me. It was incredible. So it was quite an, uh, quite an honor to be honest. Alex, what are most people surprised to learn about you when they get to know you? <laughs> that I have a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my kids and everyone make fun of me. They think I'm this real serious uh, dad and guy and coach and all of that stuff. But I, I, deep down inside, I have a real, I have a sense of humor. I like to laugh a lot. I'm very, very private. I like, to, I like to keep to myself, but I'm outgoing at the same time. So I, I think I have a good mixture, uh -huh. uh, but my sense of humor, yeah, people rarely see it. So when they do see it, they go, "Oh, I oh, oh, okay." You know? So we we are in this we are in the realm of soccer, and and I, I'm I'm really intrigued by your your journey actually. So Club Maritimo, am I pronouncing it correctly? Yeah, Maritimo. Yeah, Mar oh, oh, oh boy, yeah. Maritimo. Okay, Club Mar. You yeah. see that song is like a soccer club. There club you Maritimo. Go. So yes. seven years and all-time leading scorer. Yes. Honored as the foreign player of the year. Yes. So tell us a bit about being bought by the Portuguese number one uh, division, which is Club Maritimo. <laughs> you know, you play the game because you love the game. You play the game because, you know, I would play the game for free. And what people have to realize is that it took me a long journey and lots of perse uh, perseverance, once again, and support, once again, from family and friends. Uh, I did the tour of Europe. I went to France, to Scotland, <laughs> all over the place before I signed my first club, big club that I signed with was West Ham United of the English Premier League um, under the tutelage of uh, Billy Bonds and Harry Redknapp. Unfortunately, I didn't get to play much there because of my uh, commitment to playing on the Canadian national team for World Cup qualifying. So it kind of disqualified me to come back and get a spot on the team. So I was fortunate enough that a former teammate of mine that I played for, that I played with in Toronto in the old Canadian soccer league, Edinho, the great Edinho, the great Brazilian player. Wow. He became manager of Maritimo, and he found out about my, my situation in, at West Ham, and he, he encouraged me through a third party to come to Madeira. The beautiful, I mean, man, I'm, I'm telling you to talk about paradise. Uh, the beautiful island of Madeira. And when I went there, I fell in love with the, the island and I fell in love with the club and, and the rest is history. I, I went and played my heart off for that club, for the fans, for the supporters, and, and ended up becoming their all-time leading scorer to this day. And it's something that I'm very proud of. And I played with a lot of great players and a lot of great coaches. But most importantly, I had the greatest fans to play for. They were so supportive to this day. I love them. I love them. They'll always be a part of my heart. Who are Big some? Time. Who are some very skilled? Well, I, I uh, most all, all of them are skilled. But who are some phenomenal um, players you have played with and, and against throughout your career? Well, uh, Luis Figo. <laughs> wow, does it get any better than that? Um, <laughs> when he was at Sporting, uh, what a fantastic player! Um, you know. Roberto Baggio, mm. uh, when we played in uh, European competition against Juventus, um, Del Piero, uh, Ravinelli, Gianluco Vialli. <laughs> I mean, I, I was fortunate to play against some of the great ones. And, um, you know, you, you, you learn from that. You learn a lot. You learn a lot of the game, about the game, and you learn a lot about individuals and how they conduct themselves on the field. And for me, most importantly, off the field. So I learned a lot from those players, and I look up to a lot of those players. They were phenomenal players. What, phenomenal. Made, you, what made you so good? How did you become so good? You know, I tell, I tell a lot, I tell, especially the kids that I train, I tell them that there were a lot of players that were better than me, that were faster than me, more skillful than me. There was no player that had more passion for the, for the game than I had. Passion. I wanted 
I wanted it, man. I, I mean, that was my way out. That was me um, having an opportunity to help my mom and my siblings out. So I had this burning desire to want to be the best that I can be and be the best, period. And that was my, and, and so what that comes down to is your heart and your mind. And that was it. I'd say from the chest up, you couldn't beat me there. That, that was what separated me. You know what's interesting here, Alex? You know, I want to wait a little, a little further into the conversation to talk about these amazing things you're doing with youth development, youth and um, uh, young people and young people empowerment right. and so on. But you just dropped something here on me, and I, I got to ask you this. Yes. When you are talking to a group of young people, when you are coaching or mentoring them, mm-hmm. how much is passion a part of what you say to them? How important is passion? Passion is everything. If you don't have passion, forget about it. Mm. You you can either be ordinary or extraordinary. And I think extraordinary people are passionate about the things they do, not just in sport, but in any walk of life. If you're not passionate about it, if you don't wake up in the morning saying, man, I want this and I'm going to get it, you're not going anywhere. Um, You know, you're going to be ordinary. You know, it, it catches up to you. But if you wake up every morning wanting to get better, wanting to be better, um, and you have that passion and that drive, I, I think, it, I, no, not that I think, I know. I think I'm a perfect example of that. I know it's going to take you someplace, someplace higher. Alex, Alex, you're on the field. Yeah. You score your yeah. first professional goal. What is going through your mind? Oof. My mom. Mm. My mom. Mm. My dad. Wow. <laughs> my brother's. And my sisters, once again, it comes back to them. It comes back to that unity. It comes back. My mom, my dad, my brothers, and my sisters. First goal I scored. That's all I could think about. It's, a, it's our journey, our destiny. And I happen to be the one that the spotlight was on. But if not for them, I wouldn't be here today by the grace of God. So that was what was going through my mind. I always promised myself that if I ever have a conversation like this, with a soccer player, especially a scorer, mm-hmm. I have to ask this question. Sure. But what makes this unique, Alex, is because you're out there giving back and empowering people and building teams. So team spirit is very important to you. Yes. So you're on the field. You got the ball. Yeah. You got to score because it means a lot to you. Right. How do you balance the two? The, the team and, and the individual? Yes, sir. Well, you know... It, there is a balance there, but to be a goal scorer, you have to be, you have to have a kind of a chip on your shoulders. Oh. Um, you had that. And you had to have some kind of, uh, I want to score attitude. And I, 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 I wouldn't say what's arrogance. I, I call it confidence. Yes. And so you have to balance that because it is a team sport. But what I tell everyone is that soccer in many ways is an individual sport and everyone looks at me and they go, what are you talking about? Well, you have to win your individual battles. And then you come together collectively as a team. And I always wanted to win my individual battles against the defender that I was going against or the two defenders that I was going against. And for me to win that battle, the, the, the icing on the cake was scoring. And I wanted to score. And if I didn't score, I got upset in a game if I didn't score. Now, I'm happy for my team. I want my team to win. I'm a team player. I've always been a team player. But at the same time, I wanted to be the guy that scored the winning goal. And that's the attitude that a striker has to have. And, 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 and you know, you can't have it any other way. You want to be that guy that's going to put the ball in back of the net. You want to hear that roar. You want to hear that crowd go when you score. And I wanted that. All right, Alex. And I, and, and I went after it. All right, Alex. Yeah. We heard about the motivation, <laughs> right? We heard about the, the, the payoff, the roar of the crowd and all the, 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 the amazing sound and all these encouragement, right? Mm-hmm. But let me ask you this. What happened, when, what happened when you didn't get to score? What's going through your mind when you miss? Can you hear me? I think... I think your Wi-Fi went... <laughs> when I did... Okay, good. 
I think your Wi-Fi went down, okay. Alex. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? Yes, I think your Wi-Fi wi is fluctuating a little bit. But did you hear the question? What's going through your mind when you don't get to score? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I, I wanted to score. I, that's my job. My job is to score. I'm a striker. It's to put the ball in back in the net. I'm not happy if I don't score in a game. All right. You know, or as well. Uh, here, here's, here's the last question on this point, right? Sure. All, all, all the rewards for scoring. What was the, what did you have to yeah. fight against? Okay. What is one personal thing you had to overcome the most to make you as great as you are in terms of, in terms of scoring? What is one personal thing you thought that stood in your way? Yeah. You know, that's, a, that, that, that's yeah. myself. Ah. <laughs> Believe it or not, myself. You know, yeah, may, just me. You know, it's, it's a battle between you and yourself, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. That was the toughest thing. It wasn't my opponent. It wasn't my teammates. It wasn't my coaches. It wasn't the fans. It was me. And I had to figure out how to control my emotions. I had to figure out how to play in the moment, mm. be in the moment, and, and not let any outside actions or anything that's gone on in, at the house or anything like that. So it was yourself. And, and that's my personal experience from that. And so, others might, might differ, but for me, it was me. So you're always focused. Yeah. You Pardon always, me? Yes. You're always focused. Yes. Mm -hmm. Focus. Mm -hmm. so the engaged fo focus, whatever it is, no distractions mm -hmm. and, and no pointers. It was always, I put it on me. I didn't put it on anyone else. You know, it's easy to point fingers at everyone else. It's easy to, to blame everyone else for your misery. Um, and uh, it's an easy thing to do. The tough thing is to say, yeah, you know, things aren't going well. Things didn't go well. But you know what? I have the answer. I can control my own destiny. You know, and, and that's, 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 a, that's a tough thing, especially when you're playing. Uh, there's a passion and a religion in Europe, and you're the goal scorer, and all the focus is on you. So you have to master it. So a lot of things were mental, mental. 95% of it is mental. I want to ask you one thing, Alex, and only because this requires a lot of bandwidth. Just ensure that nobody else in your environment is using the internet because we're getting these fluctuations. Did you hear me? No, say that right. again, please. Can you make sure that no one else in the, in the, in the home or where you are is using the internet because we're getting fluctuations. Okay, I'm gonna do that for sure. Make sure of it. I don't think anyone else is, but we're All right. be, I'll get to that right now. Make sure of that for you, my brother. Okay. okay. All right, yeah. go ahead. So yeah, so Madeira, right? Yes. You were awarded personality of the year on the island of Madeira. Yes. One of the biggest, why, why, why do you think you got that, Alex? I think it's because of how I conducted myself off the field. Good answer, brother. Good answer. Yeah. Good answer. How would you say soccer helped to shape who you have become? Uh, in many ways, because soccer is about being selfless. Mm -hmm. We talked about the portion of it that you have to be selfish, but it's not selfish. It's, it's more of, um, you know, soccer really teaches you about humility, unity, diversity, tolerance. So it shaped me to become the man that I am today. And then when you throw on top of that, my upbringing from my parents and, and, and all the lessons that I learned from my older siblings and the support mechanism that I got from family members, relatives and, and friends and coaches and teammates, um, you combine all of those things and, and we can, we'll get into that later on. It takes everyone. Mm -hmm. And it was a part of that, but it wasn't everything. There were more things, more ingredients than I needed outside of soccer. And then when you add the soccer and the passion that I had for it, it made me the man that I am today. With all the flaws that I have, that I have, soccer really put me in a position where I can overcome those flaws, where I can be accountable for the mistakes that I've made, 
and, and move on and become a better person, a better dad, a better husband, a better brother, you name it, you know, and coach, whatever it is. And, and that's what soccer has done for me in many ways. Well, one, one, one last question before we take, we take a break. Sure. At 33, mm -hmm. you retired. Yeah. Injury. Yes. Were you ready to retire at that time, brother? Yes. Oh, you were? <laughs> yes, I was. Yes. Yeah, I know a lot of people ask because it's still, when you think about it, it's still young. Yes. But my ankles were gone. My, I, I mean, I had no cartilage. I still don't have cartilage in my ankles. So it was bone on bone. The pain was unbearable. And um, so I, I said to myself, the moment that I get out of bed and I don't feel the passion anymore, then it's, it's, it's once that's, again, we go back to that, that passion. So that's your cartilage right there. Yeah. There your you passion. go. Yeah. You, you nailed it, my brother. Yeah. Brother, I, I, just, I just have to ask you this, right? After you retired, yeah. you went full, full, full force into youth development, youth empowerment. Yes. If you had not retired then, do you think you would have taken this turn at the time? Yes, I think so, because, um, because of where I came from. And I've always been giving back, even as a player. I mean, I think I was one of the first uh, football players in Portugal to start uh, – uh, uh, an after-school program. It's, it's still in existence today called Escuma, Escola Futebol de Madeira, in Madeira, mm -hmm. where we, we went after underprivileged, um, disadvantaged young, youngsters. And we provided them with all kinds of fun activities and we used soccer or football as a means to get them there. And when I came back on my vacation, I gave back. I did clinics in different locations in Montreal, in Vermont, and in Minnesota. So I, I think that I would continue to do that because of where I came from and knowing the importance of having someone who, who's been there coming back and giving back to their community. So I would still be involved in that for sure because it's my passion as well. What was actually the motivator or the motivation behind starting that club? What, what were you present to when you decide, look, I'm, I'm going to start this club for the um, underprivileged children. What were you going through at the time? Well, first of all, where I came from. That's number one. And then the, the other component of that was my son, Teal. Mm. I, I wanted to be able to uh, pass on to him my knowledge and the training mechanism. So I, it, it was built around two things, wanting to give back and then wanting to be able to, to work with my son and teach him the game and spend more time with him than I did when I was playing. And that, that to me was very, very important. And I got to spend unbelievable amount of time with my son, you know, going to training, practice, you name it, talking to him, giving him tough love. I know back then he probably didn't appreciate it. I was hard on him, um, but I know that it, it, it was preparing him for the real world as well. So that, that, those are the two things I would say. Let's take a break. All right, my man. Everybody needs 
We are back with the amazing Alex Bonbury. Alex, I, I want to read a few things, um, comments in the chat room before we get, start, get started. This is uh, Frank Riga. Alex, if you get this message, it's Frank Riga, Hamilton Steelers Vice President. When you were with us, congratulations. Yes. It was a pleasure having you play for the Steelers. An honor calling you friend. Lovela, proud of you, my cuz, Frank Riga. It's also a bonus for Hamilton as an inductee of the Hamilton Soccer Hall of Fame. Wishing you all the luck and blessings with your Guyana project. Andreas, you have to help me with this pronunciation. Andreas Saratiotis? Yes, yes, Saratiotis, you did very well. Yes, good job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just made it home from these practice. Is it over? Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So let, let's, let's continue, Alex. Yes. Yeah. APSA. Yes. Right? Alex bon Bonbury Sports and Academy in Guyana. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, it's, it's, uh, it's piggy, piggyback off of the, the uh, youth development program that I started in, in Madeira. And then when I came back into the, in Canada and, and, and Minnesota in particular. And uh, what it is, it's, it's just a program that we want to we want to put together academics and sports and combine it because I think uh, having a good education is very important and and I think sports is very important especially in in in, in the region that we are from uh, Guyana um, you know we have a lot of kids like myself and yourself that we we ran around we did all kinds of ac athletic things um, in school and after school and we need to take advantage of that, the passion that they have for sports, and we have to put them in safe havens where they have state-of-the-art training facilities that can enhance their, their athletic ability, and most importantly, that can enhance them from an intellectual standpoint as well. So that's, that's, the, the, that's the, uh, the, the nucleus of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have a marriage with athletics and, and, and academics, but I also want to make sure that we have the kids in, in an environment that's safe, and that has all of the uh, equipment, technical equipment, and whatever else we need to provide for them so that they can really maximize their God-given abilities. And, and, and at the same time, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create hope and opportunity for these young people. But we're also trying to create jobs for their parents and their aunts and uncles and their neighbors and friends. So it's all about a combination of all of these things that will bring jobs to Guyana and in that region and create sustainable, well-paid jobs. And, and, you know, it, it becomes a win-win situation for everyone. And that, that's what APSA is all about. That's, that's what we're trying to put forth. What are some of the locations you have identified to um, uh, roll out some of these uh, projects? Well, our flagship is um, we're, we're currently working on, on, on the, the land lease for, for the site uh, with the government and uh, in Region 10. And our flagship location is, is somewhere in close to Linden, and um, it's in the Ituni area. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we, we, we say it's Ituni Road. Uh, once the roads are completed, it'll, it'll be like about 15, 20 minutes from Linden. And we all know how Linden is an area that is very, very uh, populated, and, and a lot of people there have lost jobs and things of that nature. So it would be a great area to 
to have something of this magnitude where we can bring tourism and all of these things. And, and, and we need to start growing outside of Georgetown because I think it's very congested in that area. And we need to have an, uh, an area where people can come and, and, and be, if you're talking about bringing uh, sporting entities into that area for preseason training and, and major sporting events, sometimes it's good to have it in a location that's not so congested mm -hmm. and provide uh, those athletes and in their, their associations with the, the, with the feeling of, yeah, we're isolated, but we, we have state-of-the-art training and, and all kinds of equipment that are, that, that are, nece that are necessities for us to, to do what we need to do to become better individually and collectively as a team. You, you visited Guyana this year and presented this to the, the government, I understand. Yes. Uh, what was the reception like? It was phenomenal. I, 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 we went there, I returned to Guyana for the first time in 40 years. <laughs> wow. So you can, you can only imagine what it was like. I went back to Plaisance to visit my relatives there, um, all my beautiful relatives in Plaisance that I love, and um, got a chance to see the house that I was born and raised in. It was very emotional. And, and that being said, I, I, we took our, um, our brainchild to the government, the vision, and, and we have some phenomenal people that worked with me um, to make this all possible. Uh, what a great team of, of individuals that are smart, love Guyana, want to see Guyana move in the 21st century. Folks that don't live in Guyana and folks that live in Guyana, my, my team is phenomenal. Um, they know who they are. I can't thank them enough for everything that they've done to make this possible as well. And, um, you know, my brother being one of them, uh, who's my uh, senior advisor. Uh, Samuel Bunbury. Um, I can talk about Charmaine Wade and, and Junior Forrester and, and um, James Paul and Stan Harmon and Roger Wilson. And, and, and the list goes on. If I forgot somebody's name, you see, this is why I don't like to name people. But we have a, a great list of people that have done. I'll, Alex, hold on a second. I, I'm trying, your, your image is stuck and I'm trying to figure out why it is. Um, okay. 